This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. Just in case you were wondering, yes, we are here. Think Tech. Community matters. We care about the community and it matters. Double entendre, yeah. And uh, we're talking about a study of the print press in the age of the internet. How can this be happening? We have living proof that it can be happening. It's Will McGough and his, his paper, it really is paper, it's a newspaper. is Wake and Wander Hawaii. Welcome to the show, Thank Will. You nice very to much have for you having here. Me. It's yeah. good to be here. Cheers. You're an aardvark. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> You're standing alone. You're an <laughs> island in the storm. How can you do this? Hey, well, I don't know. I think you just, uh, when you have a passion, you go for it, right? And uh, you see everything going one way, but you want to go another. So, I mean, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's you know, the key to following your passion. You know, there's a lesson here, and it goes way beyond the media and newspapers and Internet. It's about your passion. It's about finding something that you know excites you intellectually, excites you, gives you a, a place in the world, gives you a, a mission. Yeah, I think I think as my friends and family will tell you, I'm very stubborn, so I have a hard time taking no for an answer. So if I want to do something, I just pretty much say, okay, I'm going to do it, um, and I really have to be hit over the head multiple times before I'm like, okay, I'll back <laughs> off. But uh, I'm having fun, and so far so good. So did they like, tell you that being stubborn is a good thing? I mean, I think it is. They say it is like, you know, I don't know how they mean it, but. So how did you get involved in all of this? Where did it all start and how uh, did it evolve? Okay, well briefly, I've been a travel writer since 2010. Um, and coming up through, you know, being a young travel writer and gaining experience is a very glamorous process. You know, you're traveling around the world and penning articles. And so I didn't do too much thinking. I really just was experiencing the world and writing what I needed to write and filing stories. But I always had really an urge to actually storytell. Um, and I really, my background is in hard news and journalism and newspapers, and so I really like the idea of being on the road and uh, doing a combination of reporting, but also the storytelling and maybe putting in some flowery stuff and maybe making it come alive and inspiring people as well as informing them. Um, and as I got more experience in travel writing, I realized this was really where kind of the fork uh, you know, split. You'd have one segment of publications that really were about information, you know, guidebooks, how to do it, where to stay, um, you know, really the nuts and bolts of travel. And then you'd have this other realm where it was more just inspiration. So tell me a story from wherever you were and inspire me to want to go there. Uh, you're not going to tell me necessarily how to do that. I'm going to go figure that you know, myself, but it gets the ball rolling. Oh, I want the second one. Well, that's anyway. what I wanted too. Yeah. And so once I, you know, sort of got some countries under my feet and got some experience and started getting some street cred, I started thinking about this. Okay, like where do I want my career to go? Um, but so fortunately, unfortunately, I guess it's just the way it is. You know, as everything moved online, um, you know, the internet is really caters to that. Hmm, what do I want to do? I'm going to Hawaii next week. Okay, things to do in Hawaii, and then it pops up. And you're not necessarily looking to be inspired. You kind of already know. So by the time you go on the internet and you're searching for a destination, um, you're sort of already inspired. You know, you're, you're searching for something already. So that motivation is there. And so everything on the internet has become very service oriented. Top five hotels in Honolulu, uh, the one meal you have to eat before leaving Honolulu, 10 <laughs> things to do on Oahu, uh, just th things to like get the ball rolling. But they're already inspired to come, right? Um, you know, these things you're talking about are really of, of no spiritual value whatsoever. Well, not spiritual, but they're useful. So I understand yeah. it, right? Um, so a lot of my career took me that direction. You know, people would ask me, um, you know, to write these kind of articles for advice, you know, and, and whether it was in Hawaii or other parts of the world. Um, and so I did that for a few years, but I just had this urge, you know, to write more and to write these stories. Some of my best stories on the road, uh, I couldn't necessarily sell because people were like, yeah, well, you know, okay. And so there were a few outlets where I could get the, the bigger, the more meaningful stories in it, but it just, it was just getting less and less and less. Um, and so uh, when I decided to move to Hawaii full time, I had been out here a bunch for work. I was really inspired by the destination here and just the Hawaiian way of life and all the culture and stories. And I thought to myself, okay, I can, you know, I can do this stuff for a living. You know, I can write these kind of servicey things and I can get my occasional you know, uh, inspirational story in, or I can just, you know, start to build my own path and start to say, okay, like, I think people want to read stories that I like, you know, and um, okay, maybe they're not going to do so well online. Um, and we could talk about why they wouldn't do online later, do well online later, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe there are people out there. And so maybe I just need to create something so they can do it. 
Um, and despite what everyone says, people still do read paper. You know, people read books all the time. People read newspapers all the time. Um, certainly trends will tell you it's going this direction, but people read it, you know, like, I mean, okay, so they do. So if I just put something in front of them, will they take it and will they read it and will they like it? Will they? Well, okay, so far so good. I mean, you know, we've been around for a while and, and I think so and I get a lot of good feedback and so that's really came up. I just thought to myself, okay, I want to do something my way um, and I'm tired of getting rejected by editors and online <laughs> is not really my thing. I'm, I'm kind of an old soul in that way. And I like the idea of having something. And I think that's just the best vehicle to give someone a longer story that they really sit with a cup of coffee with or with a beer or... Somehow you know, the morning breakfast and the coffee, it all comes together with the, the, that, the, the, paper, the paper. The paper. Or just get home from work, you know, you crack your beer, you sit down, okay, what am I going to do for the next 10 minutes before my show starts? I'm gonna, it's on the coffee table, you know, it's, uh, it's on the bus, it's wherever, you know, on an airplane. exercise my mind, yeah. Um, and so I want to read a story. And I think, you know, it's on the nightstand, it takes you a month. So I just, so I, that's, that's the basis. I just, I wanted more out of my writing, and I just, I couldn't really find somebody that would take it enough and so i said okay that's it i'm just gonna i'm just gonna do yeah, it yeah and, and that's the the substance i think uh, from what you described before of the article in the civil beat a couple of weeks ago by brett opegaard yeah. about about you and about your your passion yeah you know he asked uh, i mean a very flattering question you know I, I so i he came and followed me on my paper route and so i have about 70 locations on the island where i drop this baby off and i do it all out of the back of my car um <laughs> and so uh, yeah, it's, it's quite laborious, you know, and so he came and, you know, I'm carrying the box of newspapers. It's, it's the real deal. And so he, he came with me and he, you know, so many people just walk by. I have actual street boxes that you would pull open and grab it. You know, it's free, but your box, it was, it's your box. It's my box. It's yeah. branded. And, you know, if you're not in newspapers, you know, you just walk by these things. It's almost just like a fire hydrant. You, you don't <laughs> until you need it. You don't think about it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I go and service these and then coffee shops and I'm in coffee bean and tea leaf now and I'm in a couple Safeway locations. Well, perfect. And, um, and so he just came and he was just curious and in the article he asked the question, you know, did people give up too easily on print? Um, and uh, he never really gave an answer, but he just, you know, was very flattering, cited me as one example of, okay, here's somebody trying to still make it work. Yeah, um, but maybe you know, the question is kind of assumes that people did give up on print. Maybe you're not, you don't agree with that. They did, did they give up on print? Well, I think in a way, so... Okay, so I guess it also depends on which markets you look in, but sticking to travel, you know, that's kind of my expertise. You know, there are a lot of still, you know, there are cool independent publications out there. But generally speaking, you know, as newspapers have scaled back, travel sections have gone away. Um, and as bigger publications that are run by, I don't want to say the corporations, but just a larger entity, you know, they're not a single person or a single, you know, they are... Um, they're, they're kind of, they want to make money. They want to reach the most amount of people, and they have a lot of people working for them that they need to support. And so when the internet started to rise, um, it was a lot cheaper to move a lot of the content online, way less production costs, um, and I guess they, they just weren't getting the value. The ads were kind of trickling down, and that's a hard thing to take when you have a business that's at one level and it's scaling back. Even though you may still be profitable or you may still be doing okay, nobody wants to see losses or, or backward growth. Yeah. And so. Yeah, a lot of people moved online. Um, so, uh, okay, so let's let's talk about what this is now. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Uh, let me see if I can get this on the screen. It's uh, Wake and Wander Hawaii. It's it's not it's not on the internet. You can't get this on the internet, am I right? You cannot get it on the internet. Cannot you can't get, get the content. It. So I have a website explaining what it is and where you can find it. You could also order a subscription if you want to get it at home. Yeah. But there's no content online. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. And it's uh, Hawaii's travel newspaper. It's it's written. It's um, it's printed, yep. and it's distributed here in Hawaii. That's correct. Yeah. Printed by the Hawaii Hochi, right? Hawaii yeah. Hochi, which yeah. is right down the block, isn't exactly. it? It's very close to a studio here. Yeah. And that's been published for oh, way over 100 years. They've I been think. doing their things for a long time. They've been yeah. very good to me, and it was great to work with them. And yeah, and so and well, it's quick. in English. <laughs> it's, 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 it's. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, this is so this is light paper. It's not glossy. No. Nope. Okay, but it doesn't have to be glossy. I don't think it does. And in fact, you know, some of those glossy magazines, you wonder when you open them. Am I paying for this? Yeah, well, you know, half the time they, they have this big, beautiful layout with glossy paper, and then they have a gutter with separating the big picture, you know, when you open the story. And now those things have become, I mean, they're so expensive to produce. You open it, and I challenge you to pick up a magazine somewhere 
and just put it on your counter and open it and see if you can open to a story. I bet you it takes you four or five tries before you land on some content. You're going to land on a watch ad or you know, something. It's all, it's all ads, you know, and it just, yeah. it just disappoints me. So, my, so there's no ads in here. There are ads, but okay, so let's, one thing at a time. Okay. Let's talk about the business model here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I decided to go with this, the newspaper and everything, because I wanted something that was grab and go. I didn't want this big, you know, and A, it's, a, it's cheaper to produce, but B, I wanted something grab and go where you can take it off the street, put it in your purse or your bag, and, you know, you get home and, mm -hmm. and there it is. Um, and I wanted to focus, yeah, we have pictures, but I don't need to be like, you know, some you know amazing photographer you know i'm a writer and so i want to portray my stories and i want you to be into the words and the pictures that are support that not to be the main show right um, we do have ads but i do combine some of my online experience so now uh, it's hard to make money online and that's why a lot of people that have gone that way are, are you know kind of churning through mud right now but one of the, the great things that come up online is this idea of sponsored content, you know, and a lot of publications do this now where they will sell space that may be for editorial and they kind of dress it up to look like editorial, but it's really a paid for content. But know? it doesn't present as an ad, it presents as content. It presents as content, but it is, you know, has to be labeled as, okay, this is an ad. Well, what do you label it? What do you call it? They're sponsored. So my strategy is... Sponsored sidebar. Correct. A sponsored sidebar. So, that's, that's so my main ad that I do is... Um, I want to sell a sponsored sidebar, as I call it. And so what I want to do, so if I have a story about, let's say, Maui, okay, and it's all about something that I did there, uh, I want to find somebody to sell that sidebar to that can piggyback off the content of the article. So if you're reading this about Maui and now all of a sudden you're inspired to be there, now the sidebar is going to be, yeah, it's paid for, but it's, now it's a useful column about, for in this example, Island Air. So I partner with them. So now if I'm talking about one of the islands that they fly to, okay, now, how do you want to get to Maui from here? Okay, well, here's all the information you need from Island Air. And I work with them to develop content that's useful for the reader. So when you're opening it, it doesn't jump out as an ad. And I'm not trying to deceive anybody. It's labeled. I work with companies that I believe in and that I think are good and that mm -hmm. are providing great services. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're supporting you. And then they're supporting me. And then we all win. Like every, all, every, all, all three people win. Yeah. Uh, they get their message across. I get some uh, support. And the readers get some useful information as well. And not just say a used car ad or a, a watch ad or something that has nothing to do with travel. Yeah. So I try and work with people only in the travel or that extension of those industries to be in. And if it's an industry that offends you for some reason, you're not going to deal with them yet. I mean, if it's a company that's, that I don't believe in, if it's somebody, yeah, that it's like, you know, I'm not just going to work with a nobody. I mean, I'm going to go vet them. Say like, a, you know, a, a hiking company on Oahu wanted mm. to be in and, yeah. you know, I'd have to go and vet them and see them because I'm not going to recommend somebody uh, that I don't know, even if they're going to try and pay me money. You know, I want the integrity of my publication to right. be there. This right. is not uh, a fling I'm trying to have. So this is <clears throat> it's real content. That's what it amounts to. It's this real, real content. stuff. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> That's like a lot of our shows. It's real content. I mean, we don't we don't take any money, but it's real content, even though we're talking about one company, even though we're talking about one magazine, for example, even though we're talking about Wake and Wander Hawaii, and we want to we want to promote you because yeah, you're a valuable that phenomenon in our community. Yeah. And, and before we go to the break, I just want to, I just want to visit this one thing. You're the one man band. I mean, there's few of you left in the entrepreneurial world. You write, you research it, you go out and re report, get facts and talk to people. You write it, you take the pictures. Uh, I, I'm a little surprised you don't print it like with a Guttenberg print. <laughs> printer and you know a press in the back room but you use uh, local times hochi yeah. um, and then you go out and on your little car or bike you you deliver it it's uh, so it's a completely integrated a one man band it's fabulous nobody does it anymore i mean <clears throat> uh, it, it strikes me it's it's a model out of another time and it's a model out of another world even you know yeah, well, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm not without help. Of course, I have the support of many friends and family. And I do have some, I've hired some freelancers at certain times to help me with uh, either sales or I have a columnist, Kainoa Horkajo, he's on Maui, um, help with distribution from friends and family and things like that. So I feel very fortunate. But, you know, my dad was a police officer. My mom was a nurse. I'm no stranger to, uh, you know, being brought up on grit and elbow grease. Um, and I think when you have a dream, you just make it happen. At least that's the way I see it. Yeah. I, I came here, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I, I've, I've always been a writer. I'm never going to make a lot of money being a writer. And so to start a publication, I mean, okay, I could somehow try and find an investor to get twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, and then be in debt and be under all this stress. I said, or I can just, you know, I can. I like doing it. So let me just do it. You know, I'm interested in it. And I yeah. think when you have 
that, this is the new model for print, in my opinion. You know, print publications now have so much overhead and not enough passion, not enough people who really, you know, and, and I live and breathe this thing. I think about it every day. And so I hope that comes through. Well, um, it comes through to me. It comes through to them, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> Let's take a short break. Okay, that's Will McCough, and it's Wake and Wander Hawaii. We're talking about, gee, I mean, this is really profound. We're talking about a study of print press in the age of the Internet. We're also talking about stubbornness and chutzpah. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. Bingo. I told you we'd come back, and we did come back. That's Will, Will McGough, Wake and Wander Hawaii, an example of a print press in the age of the Internet, and trying to, make, trying to figure out what makes it tick, what makes him tick, how this actually works, and what it can teach us, not only about the media, about news, about consumption of news, but about ourselves and where we fit and where we see things. So um, I guess I'm interested in... Uh, before even we get to you know what's in the what's in the paper, um, where'd you learn to write? So I was a engineer in college. <laughs> I started out as an engineering fits. program at Virginia Tech. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know I was just a kid. I was good at math in high school. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Blah blah blah. And about halfway through college, I realized I had this love affair with writing that I didn't even realize. You know, I'd be in class and scribbling, you know, poems or songs or little phrases in the sides of my notebooks, and it just it took a few years for it to click. Um, so in college, I interned for newspapers and did all that kind of stuff. And then I went to grad school. I got a master's in journalism at Temple University. <laughs> From in engineering to journalism. Yeah, I, I know, right? I know, right? So, um, hey, that's what it happens. You know, I think that's what college is for. You figure out who you are. And what's it like to love writing? What is it like? Is it, you, you're in a world of, of the written word and the spoken word. You must have a different perception of the world this way. No? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very beautiful and torturous relationship. You know, for me, it's always been um, really a push and pull thing. Sometimes I can sit down and it just flows through me and I just feel it and it just it's comes out on the page. It's just in my you, head. You hear it. it you just, hear it in your like head. It's a lightning bolt, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes it's like banging my head against my wall. You know, I just, I can't for the life of me put together two sentences that I think is good. Is that writer's cramp? You know, it's just it's it's just something that I've always dealt with, you know, and people call it writer's block or this or that. And, um, you know, I there's always advice out there on how to deal with it. But it's just for me, it's like some days you got it and some days you don't. Yeah, and it's just the, the way it is. Flow, yeah, and you just, yeah. But it teaches you to be sort of resilient. You know, you just you get beat down one day and then you come back the next day and you do it. And um, and I think that's just taught me a lot of especially helping me starting this business and going through ups and downs. So what are your basic principles in putting a, putting an article together? I mean, I, for as an example, you know, in my own view, no extra adjectives, um, no, no, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? No, no, over the top, um, just the facts, man, with the well chosen words. That's me. Yeah. What What are your principles? So, let's see. I think the year was 2012, maybe 20. Maybe 2011. I got fired from a job at a writing center at, uh, <laughs> at Santa, <laughs> Santa Barbara City College, okay. um, and because <laughs> I guess I'm not meant for academic, but I was, t you know, kids would come in, you know, and these are, you know, in college kids, and and you know. They were just, they couldn't write because they were so hung up on all the rules, right? And so they would come in and ask, like, oh, I don't understand thesis statement or I don't understand the Oxford comma. And so I would give advice like, hey, whenever you want the reader to pause, just put a comma, you know, and get on with it. Because these kids, they have, they're so hung up on the rules that they just can't get over it to just, you know, write it. They can talk, but putting it on paper. And so I realized how much people were getting tripped up. So I'm very, like, I'm kind of a no rules guy. People say you have to know the rules in order to break them. Whatever. But there's yeah. a point there, and, and the point is that, that the copy should read 
as if someone were speaking it, right? It's, it's vernacular. It's, it's the, the spoken language writ written, right. and that's different than what we see a lot. 100%. And so my theory is this, okay? And I learned this being a professional journalist because once things moved on to the Internet, like I was saying, everything becomes lists and very formulaic, right? And so anybody can do that. You know, you don't, if you're a writer, if you're not a writer, I mean, you can, you can construct a list and you can follow a format. You can do basic journalism. You know, you can learn how to do that in a few weeks. Um, but as a writer, the one thing you have that makes you unique and unlike anybody else is your voice. So once you stop writing in your voice and you say, okay, I'll do it your way, then you devalue yourself. You take away everything that you have that separates you from somebody else. So my opinion and how I do this magazine and how I try and do all of my work when I can is I say, I don't really care how you want me to do it. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. And if you don't like it, cool, go read something else. Yeah. But there's going to be enough people out there that are going to like my voice. And that's what's going to make me different from anybody else. And that's my best advice for young writers. It's stop doing it everybody else's way. You know, Find your way and stick to it. So if I asked you what your way was, could you define it? Could you describe it? Could you give me a, a statement of what it is and what it should be looking for? I mean, I think it's changed as I've grown, and I think that's totally natural. You know, I think whatever I'm hung up on at a certain time, you know, and that's changed over the years. Um, but I just want to tell a good, honest story. And in travel, most of the time, the story, what I think I'm going to write about, I end up finding something else. You know, something else happens. Um, and so I generally, I like to do a narrative tale that really brings myself in the story, but not look at me like a selfie, like, hey, here I am. It's see through me, you know, kind of see through me. And as you read more of what I write and as you follow my publication or my career, I hope that you'll begin to get me a little bit. And that way, when I guide you, and I think that's what all the best writers have done, you know, yeah. I mean, so much of when you read old novelists, you know, Hemingway and those guys, yeah. I mean, it's because... People understand the writer, you know. Now with the internet, nobody even looks at bylines. So it's so hard. People don't really follow writers anymore necessarily. I guess in book writing still yeah. some. But Let me see uh, Anthony Bourdain. Yeah, I've seen his show. What do you think about comparing you to him? Well, I think he's a completely unique guy than I am, you know. He's, <laughs> first off, he's a chef, which well, I Well, but not. when he goes on his, um, you know, his food tours or his, his travel, you know, uh, he tries to be, he tries to be a, a, a vessel, if you will, I think. And through him, you know, you learn about the people around him and all that. And, and he's telling a story more than the food and more than the place. He's telling a story of the people he meets. 100%. Aren't you doing the same thing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've never met him personally, but I think he does an admirable job of um, really seemingly so being himself. You know, he walks into a place and he tells you, and from all the stories I hear about him, you know, he's not shy. And so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't, he's obviously had a, very long and successful career, so to compare myself to him would be idiotic. Would you ever go into video? Would you ever take this idea and go into video? It's not as old-fashioned as paper, but it's, it's, it's less new than internet. Yeah, I never say no to any opportunity, so if that's something that comes along in my career, I'd be happy to meet that head on. Yeah, we got to uh, talk about that after the show. I mean, okay, I'm explore sure. that with you. So in any event, um, this story, I'm looking at this story because it, it, it caught my eye when I first saw this. Traveling to Hawaii in the 1920s. You know, that was the heyday, or at least one of the most important heydays in Hawaii, especially in Waikiki, um, and it's worth studying. Why did, you, why did you pick it, though, and what did you cover in it, and how did you report it, and what's the takeaway for me of this story here on the front page of your July-August 2017 Wake and Wander Hawaii? Yeah, so, okay, so I like dipping into things that other people don't necessarily think about. And you can tell the same old historical stories over and over again, but really how this story came about is I, um, I was at the Bishop Museum and I met a guy named DeSoto Brown, and he's, we the, know him. he's the historian. He's, he's one of our hosts uh, right here at this table. How do you like that? He's, he's great, a, He's a great guy. He's a great guy. <laughs> awesome. And so we just got conversation and we hit it off, you know, and I, you know, I thought, what, what could we do together? And I had used him as a, a source on some other stories I had done, you know, just to give me some perspective. And, you know, and, and he actually kind of brought up the idea. He said, what, you know, have you ever thought about looking at the decades? Because Hawaii is just so unique in the way it's changed. Um, and especially, uh, and so in, in a previous issue, we did a whole history of Waikiki itself, you know, kind of decade by decade. And then he thought, what if, we, what if we expanded that to Hawaii? You know, this is the 1920s or before planes even came here. So if you came here, you had to take a boat, and it would take weeks to get here. So only really the rich of There's the rich benefit in that. came here, <laughs> and they stayed for weeks. And they, they really, you know, and the other islands weren't set up. You know, there was um, very limited infrastructure on a lot of the other islands. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've kind of decided just to take this, this historic route. And he's a very good writer and a good storyteller. 
Um, and so we've actually partnered up on a series. So next issue we'll be doing the 1930s when uh, the jet travel had started by that time and Hawaii really had this love affair with with uh, Hollywood in terms of its marketing. So marketing Hawaii is this glamorous like LA kind of place. And so I, I hope people check that out too. Yeah. So it's been a really cool series. Don't, don't forget about uh, call, uh, Hawaii Calls at the Moana uh, Banyan Courtyard. That was really a center of Hawaii promoting itself to the world. Uh, Webley Edwards was the guy who, who did that. And I always admire him for what he did. He lived a long time into the 50s or the 60s. But in the 30s, that was his heyday. You know, with the Hapahali music, playing it for the world, hooking up national, international uh, radio hookups to play. It was something else. Part Sounds of that, like you part and of that era. have a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm sure yeah. he knows about that. Yeah. So in a story like this, of course, it's historical and it's nostalgic and it's educational for people who don't really know too much about the history in that period. But what's the takeaway? Well, you know, would you agree with me, Will, that, that every story has a takeaway, whether you articulate it or not? For sure. At the end of the day, and whether you, you know, whether you really want to articulate, whether you want to have a takeaway or not, there is a takeaway. There always is. They read your mind. They figure it out. Um, what's your takeaway? I think the takeaway is just a little bit of inspiration and a little bit of perspective, you know, and to just create... Um, just kind of build upon your own reality. It's so easy when you're just riding to work every day, you get in your day to day and you just don't really think about things. You just want to be distracted most of the time. Um, and so I think these, uh, whether it's this historical story where you're going to learn something about the place you live and you're going to, next time you go through Waikiki or drive past, you're going to think about that story you read. Um, I think that's miraculous and really a cool thing. Um, but with all my stories, just to, just to stir something and, and, okay, so my mantra is wake and wander. I mean, that's the name of my company. Um, and, uh, and I believe in waking up and trying something new every day and sort of getting yourself involved in something you didn't really expect to. Uh, and so that's really the takeaway from all my stories. So even if you're like, wow, okay, Will was in Japan doing some weird thing. I have no idea what he was doing. You know, um, at least it inspires you to say, okay, well, what can I do here? You know, that's cool. Will does that. So let me, you know. So that's my main motivation. I want to inspire people. Yeah, it's great. It's because it, it's inspiration beyond beyond the words, um, even beyond uh, beyond the newspaper. It's inspiration to how to live your life. No, well, I yeah. hope so. Yeah. yeah. So how are you going to live your life going forward? Because I tell you something, you know, if you're the one man band that makes this happen, even with help, if you're the one man band that keeps on making it happen from issue to issue, think of the ideas, write the ideas, you know, pull things together. Um, that, that may not be sustainable over a ro really long period of time. What happens to Will here? Well, you know, I'm fortunate that my experience has always been a hustle. You know, as a freelance writer, I've been doing it since 2010, so, geez, almost seven, eight years now. And so, and that, that is running your own business. You know, being a freelance writer is pitching ideas and finding new people to take your stories and, and you know, constantly, I mean, I've been on the road at the height of my career for two, three years. I was on the road three weeks a month, you know, so I'm just gone. So juggling a lot, and I still travel about two weeks a month from Hawaii, you know, going places. So, um, you know, I'm a live in the present kind of guy. I mean, obviously, I want to look ahead with some sort of responsibility, but uh, this is a new venture for me, and new ventures have unknowns, you know, and I'm going to push into that, and I'm going to find a way to make it, you know, happen, whatever I, you know, I've, I've, I've done well in everything I've done, so why shouldn't I believe that the next step is going to be that same way? You're going to so. continue to be stubborn? Exactly. I mean, for now example, you're getting, now you're getting. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the important thing, you know. You've got to be a free spirit. It's about a free spirit. Exactly. But suppose one day in the morning, you know, early in the morning, right after you wake and about the time you start thinking about where you're going to wander, okay, you get a call from the New Yorker magazine in Manhattan. They say, we'll be, we've been reading your stuff. We need to have it because your writing style, your way of looking at things really fits with what we're doing. And we're going to pay you a million billion. And all you've got to do is come to Manhattan. And, you know, get in that cubicle and write these stories for the New Yorker magazine. What's your answer? Oof. Well, I'm not a cubicle guy, and I'm not a big <laughs> fan of New York. So <laughs> I like to visit New York, but I don't think I live there. You know, I mean, like I said, I mean, you know, things change, and maybe opportunities come, and I'll consider them all. But right now, I really love what I'm doing, and I think it's, uh, I feel really lucky. You know, and the great thing we have about, uh, just for me, I feel overly lucky. I'm, I'm college educated. You know, when I travel to some poorer countries, you know, you see people that really don't have opportunity. And so, um, you know, okay, maybe I'm not a millionaire and I, you know, people have this or that and uh, I'm not writing for the New Yorker, but I'm enjoying my life and I have opportunity. And so I'm a pretty happy guy. Okay. So before we go, I just, I, I want to explore one other thing. So this, it's possible for me to get a subscription to this, it not is. just pick it up uh, at a restaurant, you know, in a, 
is a free bin. I guess it, the, the bin is free. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, or, or on the street, the street bin is free. Yep. But suppose I want to have a reliable subscription where, where you can come <laughs> on your car or your bike and deliver to me every <laughs> month or two. Um, so how do I do that? And you're probably going to tell me I have to go to the website. So in order to get the print press, I have to go on the internet and yeah, <laughs> sign up, ironic, am I right? right? It's ironic, hey, <laughs> hey, I'm using, you know, the internet's not bad, you know, I think it's a useful tool, but okay, so here's the deal. I, I'm in about 70 locations on Oahu. Uh, I'm in one on Maui and Kauai in a partnership with Coffee Bean, um, but most of the stuff's here, so it's about 70 locations. I, it's free everywhere except at the airport, Honolulu Airport. We have uh, four stores there where it's sold for three bucks. So you can support me there. Otherwise, you're right, you can get it free. But if you want to support me or you just, you know, you don't feel like going to grab it, you can go onto the website, wakeandwanderhawaii.com, and sign up for home delivery. For people that live on the island, it's 30 bucks a year. If you're on the mainland, it's 50 bucks a year. And that money goes to me and to help the production. And obviously, honestly, most of it goes to postage to mail it to you. So I don't really make a ton <laughs> off of it. But, you know, I just, I want to get people interested in writing again. And I think there people are. And, um, you know, print has such an advantage over internet that I don't think, I think print people have lost their mojo. We can put a box anywhere we want on the street. What industry can just put their product wherever they want it? You know, I can, that street corner, boom, right? And as the internet's taken over, print's just sort of backed off. You know, they haven't said, okay, you know what? I'm gonna market myself. You'll see all my newspaper boxes. We have stickers with our slogans on it. You know, I'm trying to fight back a little bit. I'm just trying to make it fun and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. So I hope that people pick it up more so than subscribing or anything, I just hope they read it and say, okay, this is pretty cool. Yeah, be part of that. That's right. Will McGough, thank, thank you so, so much, much Will. Great Appreciate discussion. It. Wish you well. All right.